sons and mothers, daughters and more. We are judges, fathers, sons, we're doctors, healers and more. We are Good morning. Hi. I am so glad you tuned into the world according to Amote. It's my world and now it's your world. We're living free in the truth. Stay tuned. Get ready. You're going to enjoy and be blessed. Glad you tuned in to the world according to Amote. Living free in the truth. Live free in the truth. Live free in the truth. The word according to Amote. Hi. Welcome to The World According to Amote. I'm so glad you joined me today. You're in my world now. And in my world, we talk about the things that are important to us. We talk about the things that are happening in real life. We talk about how to use the Bible to live a life free, to live a life without fear. That's what freedom really is, is to be able to be unencumbered, unencumbered, un bound by fear, fear of what people think, fear of can it happen, fear of what will happen, fear of I don't know, fear of uncertainty. Fear is bondage. And so to be free means you have a confidence about yourself, means that you have choice, that you can choose to do this or that, and, and you can move and know that it's going to be all right. So we're talking today I want to talk some about something that we're going to be talking about on a pretty regular basis, something that's very important to us and certainly very important in my world. It's something that God has called me to, even though I have to tell you, um, someone asked me, well, why are you into, why are you doing this? Is it because somebody in your family? Is it because something happened to you? And I had to say, no, 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 but just, you ever had a situation, but God, well, what am I talking about? I'm, we're going to be talking about the incarceration, the justice system, prison reform. We're going to be talking about the fact that the United States holds 5% of the world's population and 25% of all people incarcerated. Why is that? And certainly, we're, uh, Americans are not any aliens or different people that are more criminally in, 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 engaged or more criminally leaning bent than any other people it has not to not really doesn't have anything to do with the proclivity of the people as much as it does the system and the system that we're in has been geared for a lot of different reasons and we can really talk about that and we will talk about it as time goes on to to put people in bondage to to uh, utilize the 13th amendment for example let me go right there the 13th amendment which is something i think needs to be um, changed or modified at the very least says that there's no slavery in america except for people who are incarcerated for felons can you believe that check that out again the 13th amendment no slavery in America. We thought slavery ended. That was the whole Civil War was all about that and everything. We thought it was done. 13, 14, 15 Amendment. We thought slavery was, is over. Now we're free. Hey, free at last. Except if you're a convicted felon. Now what does that mean? What that means is chain gangs. What that means is paying people 15 cents for a day's labor. What that means is dehumanization and brutalization all these kinds of things are legal because except for if you get caught or convicted you've heard of the world according to amote you might be wondering how do you say that well it's just amo and te amote Welcome back to the world according to Amote. And as I stated, there's a fellow, Robert Dubois, or Du Bois, who was convicted of a felony that he did not commit. And that's the argument that some use against the death penalty, that now because of DNA and other things, we can prove certain people who did not commit a crime. And if you kill them, then that's the end of that story. There's no opportunity for their, their innocence to be proven. So we live in a system that is, justice is not blind, 
she's actually looking where you know i would like to see perhaps if an experiment where a judge was just given information about a case and the judge and the lawyers could even argue the case but the, but they could not with the judge or the jury could not see the people who were involved they couldn't see the person who's accused they couldn't see the person who is the one who's being prosecutor or the one who was the victim. If they could not see these people, would we all have the same results? Our statistics, our statistics seem to suggest that that's not true. Our statistics seem to suggest that it would be to that there are totally different results because people can see the people involved. Because in this country, I'm going to look at some statistics here. Oh gosh, I don't know that word statistics, but I'm going to look at some statistics here and show you something that in this country the a lifetime likelihood of imprisonment in the United States for people born in 2001 if you're any a male a man a man of any sort you have a one in nine chance of being in prison in America Ugh, that's a lot let's look at some statistics about who has a chance of being incarcerated in America, the place that has one quarter of all people in the world incarcerated? And since we're talking like that, I'm going to put my glasses on. So all, pe all men, if you're a male, and most people in prison are men, by the way. But if you're a man in America and you've been born in 2001, you have a one in nine chance. That's less one in ten. That's less than one, one in nine chance of being incarcerated. If you're a white man, of which the, the majority of Americans are, by the way, you have a 1 in 17 chance. Wow. If you're a black man, which is a minority group of, uh, let's see, about, if it's 330 million people in America in the last census, not the one we just did, and they were about um, 40 million or 49 million blacks, say blacks are about less than 10, a little more than 10% of the total population. But if you're a black man, your chances go to one in three of being in prison. I have to say that again. If you're a male in America, you have a one in nine chance. If you're a white man, one in 17, one fifth almost. But if you're a black man, one in three, I'm not making it up. These are US government statistics. If you're a Latino man, one in six. Well, we can't forget we females, and unfortunately, most women are in prison because of a man, but in, you know, that's another point. But if you're a woman in this prison system of America, you have a 1 in 56% chance of getting in prison. Because remember, there are more men who, who actually do commit more crime, and then whether they commit crime or not, are more accused and more convicted of crime than women. So one in 56 chance. And if you're a white woman, again, the majority, you have a one in 111th opportunity to be incarcerated, to be in the justice system. If you're a black woman, remember white woman, one in 111, a black woman, one in, one in 18. One in 18, one out of 18 black women have a chance to be incarcerated. If you're a Latino, one out of 45. Now, unfortunately, the, the US government at this time didn't have statistics about, this is from even back in 2015, about Asians, Native Americans, of which they have astounding statistics as well in this, in this system. We went from, in 1970, incarcerating 357,000 people to 2015, over 2 million people. That's a lot of jails. That's why people call it the prison industrial complex. It's a business. That's why the federal government even turned it into a for-profit business. That's why some communities vie and, 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 and compete and struggle to get a prison in their community because it's jobs. An economy built around dehumanizing, punishing, criminalizing its own citizens. Where do we go from here? 
You may know someone, you yourself may be someone, or you've heard of someone who's involved in the criminal justice system. So, like I said, I don't know anybody. I had one cousin who was in, who was in prison. God rest his soul, he passed away. I didn't know any other people before God told me to do this. I hadn't been arrested myself. I had, I had, I had some brushes with the, with the law in my, in, my, in my own personal life. As a young woman, I was a tennis pro. On my way to do some classes, some instruction with my tennis rackets on my back and my gym clothes, you know, you know, you know in summertime you have shorts and t-shirts and everything. And at that time I, was, I wore a uh, short haircut and uh, coming through the train station in Brooklyn, a police officer was standing by the turnstile. I saw him, he saw me, and I put my fair thing in and I went in. And all of a sudden he, comes, he calls me and comes behind and, tell, and calls me out of the having gone through and pulls me to the side and starts questioning me about did I pay my fare? I said to him, look, you, you saw me pay my fare. And of course I did. He proceeded and was on the verge of like taking this to another level, like possibly at the very least writing me a summons and at the very most arresting me for something that totally didn't even happen. Because maybe by this time he realized I wasn't a black male. And secondly, because of my own family upbringing, I immediately started writing down his name and badge number and let him know that I'm taking that information. Something came to his mind that he did, then decided to change his mind and let me go back through. That very situation could have gone a whole other way. I could have so-called resisted. He could have tried to arrest me. I could now have a record. I could have been beat upside my head. Anything could have happened. In that case, either he was totally mistaken, or he was trying to meet a quota, or he was just out for somebody that day. I don't know, and I'll never know what it was, but I can thank God that time it wasn't me. That time I wasn't one of those statistics. But many other people have been those statistics. We all know and the world knows about a name that will go down in world history, George Floyd. I believe most people who go into law enforcement are doing it because they want to help people. I believe that most people who go into law enforcement are trying to do the right thing. I believe that. I've experienced that and I believe that. And I have many law enforcement family members and other associates as well from FBI, CIA, corrections, local police, state troopers, military police. I believe in law enforcement. I believe law enforcement, like anybody else, like any other people in any other profession, they're excellent people. They're the majority people. They're the slowful, the loafers, and there's some bad apples. And there's some people who shouldn't even be in the profession. And certainly we saw that in the case of George Floyd. But bigger than that, what, we, what I'm going to be talking about is because we're not dealing with an individual person and this and that and all. We're talking about a system. A system is something that works regardless of who the person is. A system is like the river that flows regardless of what ship is in it. So we need to look at what system is it in America that can produce these kinds of numbers continuously. What system in America and what can be done about it? First of all, one of the things about the system is it's a very expensive system. It's very costly to, incorpor to incarcerate a, an individual, a human being, to house them, to feed them, to guard them, to do all the things around, uh, to heat the building, 
the, 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 and the, the maintenance of the property, to do all the things around caging people, it's a very, 24-7, uh, it's a very costly endeavor. And then, and in, in, my, in my state, in New York State, I believe it costs, what I've been quoted, is over $80,000 a year. Good salary. <laughs> the guards are, are not even making that much, some of them. And in, in Texas, the guards are making so little money that they help the prisoners to escape. They got paid more helping the, the prisoners escape than they were getting on their salary. But yet, the, it costs more to keep those people incarcerated. Then, it, the story gets even worse. Once they get released, now you've done your so-called served your time, and they get released. In some cases, they give them $42 and hit the road jack. Some cases, they might give them a $200. Whatever they give them and now release them on their own to society with a mark, like the scarlet letter, with a mark on there, what can, where can you go with $200? Where can you go with $42? What room can you rent? What apartment can you get for any length of time? I know in other places of this country like Kansas and you can rent out there for $200 a month and maybe North Carolina, some other, I don't want to name your city or your state, but it's not New York. <laughs> and it's not most of the urban, the big cities around this country. And even in the smaller places where you can for $200, and you're not getting $200 in those places. A man or a woman is thrust into the community with no support. So then what happens? In a place like, an urban place like New York City, They'll either become homeless or go into a shelter, which is another place because it takes thousands and tens and twenties of thousands of dollars to maintain. So now the government has to pay for them to live in a shelter system or they're living on the street. We're paying both ways. There has to be a better way, and I believe there is. First of all, the 13th Amendment needs to be changed. All people, our people are humans, and regardless of what they've done, deserve the right to be treated as humans. You've made a mistake before in your life. I've made mistakes before. And we should get punishment commensurate, appropriate with the mistake or the crime. Yes, I'm all for that. But people should retain their dignity. People should be able to maintain their humanity in the midst of that. And let's do it in a way that we're not paying triple, triple four. We're paying to, to go through the, the system. We're paying to hold them in the, in the incarceration. Then we're paying when they come out with no skills and no, and no, no support to get themselves organized and make a contribution, a positive contribution into society. This is a problem, but it can be fixed. It doesn't have to be this way. There's so many places, so many access points for us to change the system that it can benefit all of us. If you, if you just look at 25% of the entire world's population, millions of people of our population who are no longer working, paying taxes, creating new inventions, being a parent, no longer contributing to the good of our society and the world, Look at the, the limitations that we've placed on ourselves. And not to mention the fact, as I kind of alluded to already, not all of these people have actually done anything wrong. Sometimes they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Sometimes they were in the right place by the wrong person. My neighbor, who's 81 years old, it's interesting how trauma is not like pain. Pain is something that happens and you remember about it. Trauma, it's still happening. At 81 years old, he tells a story with the full effect of the trauma like it's happening right now. That he was coming home from work one morning. He's a tradesman, he is a printer by trade. He was coming home from work in the morning. He'd worked at night before. and a police officer pulls him over, not having done anything wrong, pulls him over and then asks him for, and he asks, what did I do wrong? And the cop goes at his gun and says, I could blow your brains out. 
what? The, co the police officer's partner was on the other side of the window saying, trying to talk him down. It's all right, man. It, 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 call him to tell his, his buddy, it's okay. And he says, I could blow your brains out? And his hand on the gun? This 81-year-old man is still hurting, is still traumatized for doing the right thing and being in the place with the person who the wrong day. We want to look at ways in which this system can be improved and ways in which it doesn't have to be so skewed, obviously, disproportionately to just one segment of the American population. Well, how, do, how, do, how, how does Amos say come into it? Because that's a lot right there. I can't do all of that, but we collectively as, an Amer as Americans, we can make, we have a will and we can make a difference. And you in your other countries all around the world is the people can make a will and make the change of however they want things to be. But one of the things that I can do and I am a part of doing is I founded an organization called Joseph Prison to Palace Program. It's a reentry program. It's a program for men who've been incarcerated in prison to when they come out to provide stable housing because I learned the hard way that housing, stable housing, is essential. When I got called into this work and I just started, I, I thought that giving people academic classes, socialization classes, family classes, communication courses, entrepreneurial skills, that's the way to make a citizen again, a successful citizen. And it is, and we do that, and it's important. But if you don't have a place to lay your head, if you're worrying if you're going to have a bed tonight, if you're worrying about will they steal my phone off of me in this public bed, if you're worrying if I'm going to catch COVID in this barrack environment, if you're worrying what you're going to be exposed to in your temporary bed situation, that's not a good situation to even think in. Not a good situation to be able to go out and look for a job and come back to when you have a, 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 a trunk size space to store your entire life possessions. That's not an environment to learn and grow in. So I learned that housing is premier. Housing is first and then all the rest. I learned, when I say the hard way, because we had a dear friend, a man that I met a couple years ago who was formerly incarcerated for most of his life. It started when he was yet a boy and his caregivers. He had, as a child, his mom was beaten almost to death. The children were separated. He lived with a family member. He and his brother and his other sisters were separated to other members. And when the caregivers who were great with him, who loved him, but then the husband got cancer and died. It shattered the whole family. When the husband got cancer, his belief in God was shattered. When the man died, the mother, the aunt, was not able to financially support and she was a emotionally wreck. He thought it was his duty as a 12 year old to get money somehow ended up robbing the church and they arrested him and started his life in the system. He served a lot of time and came out. I met him after four years of him being out. He had a full-time job. He had gotten his college degree in prison. He had rehabilitated himself through a lot of therapy and counseling and a will to change. And he was now all about restorative justice. He understood. He joined the board of Joseph Prisoner Palace and he worked diligently. He was reliable. He was on time. He was passionate and enthusiastic. In his full-time job, in the midst of COVID, his landlord said, you have to go. He was renting a room 
in a house. In, an, in New York City, when a landlord wants to take their possession of their build their home for them for themselves and their family, they have 100% every right to do that. So in 30 days, in March, when New York City became the epicenter of the entire world, he was with a shopping cart on the street, homeless. We tried to find a place for him. We found many places, but none good enough to meet his requirements because of his previous crimes. He ended up going to the shelter. And the shelter was a dismal situation. Thank God he, there's a shelter, it was a bed, a place. And if you, if you, he, if you want, he wanted to go visit his, his, one of his ailing aunts, they told him if you go that night, you might not be guaranteed your same bed again. You might not even be guaranteed a bed. He couldn't even leave, the, couldn't even go someplace because he wanted to keep his bed. Fast forward, fast forward through a lot of other things, Howard died in the shelter. A man who didn't take medication, had no high blood pressure, no cholesterol, no diabetes, died one night in the shelter. So I've learned the hard way. Housing is most important. So this is what Joseph Prisoner Palace is here to do, to help people have supportive housing, safe, stable housing. And then all the other matrix involved that you can not only be a citizen, but a productive citizen. Not only get a job, but become an employer of labor. You too can have some role in helping our country. Look at how you might get involved at any one of these points in this criminal justice system. There's something we all need to do because it affects all of us. The whole nation is at a loss for warehousing and brutalizing men and women in our country. Let's make a difference. Thank you for being part of my world today. I know it sounded a little heavy, a little serious, but it's going to get better and better because we're going to do something about it. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you tuned in and I hope you tune in next week. I'm looking for you and I'm expecting you because you're part of Amalte's world, the world according to Amalte. We're living free in the truth. See you next time. Wow, thanks for watching. I know you got something out of that. So I'm glad you tuned into the world according to Amalte. And we're living our best life because we're living free in the truth. Tune in next week and get more. We got other things in store for you. Same time, same channel, 5.30 a.m. on Wednesdays, every Wednesday on the Now Network. And guess what? We're praying for you. See you next week. Live free in the truth. The world.